Okay, so thank you everyone for coming. I uh, always appreciate that. Uh, my name is Steven, and here's my uh, co-panelist, Anne. Hello. And this is How to End a Pokemon Movie Musically. <laughs> So, uh, let's give, going to give you guys a brief overview. Uh, we're going to talk about who we are and our background, uh, some fundamental assumptions we have, sort of a brief overview, uh, some of our observations, and then it's just going to be Q&A. So if you have questions about Pokemon music or want to share what your favorite is, stuff like that, that's all good, and we'll have a good amount of time is what we're planning for that, okay? All right, so first off, let's see who we are. So my name is Stephen Reich. Uh, I operate a YouTube channel called Poke Press. And uh, we do a lot of interviews uh, with various folks, some other like uh, news type stuff, but a lot of musically related uh, sort of interviews and discussions and things of that nature. So that's, that's sort of the bulk of it. Um, there are a lot of musician interviews. Some of those include John Leffler, who wrote the original Pokemon theme and worked for many years on the TV show uh, for the dub. Let's see, Mark Chait who, uh, if you don't know, co-wrote the Power of One song for the second movie, speaking of end themes. And uh, I've also interviewed Aaron Bowman, uh, who did a number of things in the fourth and fifth generation of the dub of the anime. So those are just a few of the things there. Uh, my website is pokepress.blogspot.com. Uh, for many years, I also used to manage something called the Pokemon Internet Radio Network, or PIRN, I uh, ran that from 2000 to 2015, so some of you may know that. Anyone recognize my voice? It's okay if you don't. We never had that big of a listenership. Uh, but I do have a large collection of Pokemon music from the U.S., Japan, Europe, and a few other places. And uh, for this discussion, uh, I'm going to be bringing more of a Western perspective. I did spend like a week and a half in Japan, but... I don't know the language that well, so I'm speaking more from the Western perspective of the Pokemon music. Okay, Anne, uh, why don't you uh, go ahead? Okay. Well, I I'm Anne Werner. I'm a, an actor, a writer, and a Vocaloid musician, and uh, I do audiobooks, and you can hear me in Loose Cannon, the audio web series, if you're that interested. Um, but what I do with Pokemon is I run Peak Happy Podcast, and it goes through the entire Pokemon series and analyzes the character development and the storytelling and random facts like Ash is actually trilingual, who knew? Um, and my education was I got a BFA in acting and then with a Japanese minor. So I got to go to Japan and I was, did some acting there. I attended Kobe University. And I also worked in a daycare with a bunch of little children who loved Pokemon. So that's the angle that I'm coming at it with. Is I, I also have a Western perspective, but I have a bit more um, ability to read data on the Japanese side as well as the perspective of some of the people I knew over there and how they responded to Pokemon. Yeah, if you want to check out Anne's stuff, she's at pkppodcast.blogspot.com. Right now you're working through Advanced Generation. I forget if you're in Season 6 or technically Season 7. We have technically made it into Season 6. We, or at least we've switched opening themes. Okay. I... <laughs> all right. Well, so you may be wondering how this all got started. So let's see. So about two years ago... Uh, and I started a discussion series where we take the uh, English and Japanese endings of each Pokemon movie and we sort of compare and contrast. We do research. Uh, that's where Han has been pretty helpful because on the Japanese side, I'm kind of don't know much about many of the artists. Um, but uh, we started that in 2016. And uh, the latest one we did, this is, uh, right now this is exclusive to Anne's Patreon, but it should be on my channel in a few weeks. Uh, she gets a one-month exclusivity on most of our regular discussions. This one will be out a little bit sooner on my channel. Um, but we did the Victini movies, not movie <laughs> movies, because for those of you who aren't aware, there were two Victini movies with two different ending songs. On both sides. On both sides, <laughs> although one side was more different than the other, and we had a lot of fun uh, discussing that. Uh, musically, is, is actually, in a way, how the things are, are the most different there. No, that was a fun one. Now, I should point out that for our discussions, we generally discuss the first song in the end credits if there are multiple songs, so you may be a little disappointed by our first movie discussion in which we pull from the English side, uh, We're a Miracle, and uh, not Don't Say You Love Me. Um, <laughs> Yeah, to be honest, I think that makes it not that Don't See You Love Me isn't some horrible song or anything like that, but We Are a Miracle, a lot more interesting, a lot more tied to the movie. Mm. Um, 
And uh, this is mostly U.S. versus Japan in our discussions, but we do try to bring in other things. Versus is used a little loosely. But. Yeah, yeah. We're, when we get to our assumptions, we'll kind of explain. We go for a certain tone here that is probably not what you might be used to on the Internet lately. <laughs> Um, but uh, we've done some special episodes, right, Anne? Uh, yeah, we did um, uh, some episodes about European Pokemon music, and because a lot of people don't realize that they actually have, promo have composed original music over there as well. And then we did a fun one where it was like, if our favorite bands did a Pokemon song, like, they never have, but you know, I think you were in excess and I was the J-pop group Perfume. Yeah. Yeah, you picked, uh, yeah, Perfume, I picked uh, Australian rock group In Excess. And if you know the history of that band, it's kind of obvious why they didn't do a Pokemon song. They were kind of out of commission during the peak years, uh, unfortunately. But, um, yeah, Perfume, I, I learned a lot about that, and I think you learned a fair bit about... I sure did learn about In Excess. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Well, yeah, so that's kind of some of the stuff we've done. We try to do that in between generations of the anime. So actually, we just did European music between Gens 4 and 5. Mm -hmm. And we've got two more Gen 5 movies. And then we'll be doing another special episode of some sort. We haven't decided yet. One thing you can bring up here is if you have ideas for a band that's never done a Pokemon song, and you think one of their songs would work really well, past tell or present, us about it. Tell yeah, us tell about us about it. it. We might end up using that uh, in between the fifth and sixth generation <laughs> movies. But that's sort of uh, our discussion series. Now, we have a few fundamental assumptions. I know that sounds kind of boring, but I'll try to make it interesting. <laughs> so, uh, like most forms of art, uh, judging music is inherently subjective. Um, we, do, we don't think that there's necessarily a right or wrong judgment. And uh, we don't expect you to have a music theory background. You shouldn't need to even ha you know, know how to play an instrument or anything like that for this discussion. We try to keep it fairly open and, and not dive too deep into terminology. Yeah. Most of my input is, that sounds so pretty. I like that. And <laughs> yeah, you don't have to be technical and know about the circle of fifths or anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Anne obviously has some stage background. Uh, my parents are current or former orchestra teachers, and I learned playing the cello. But we don't expect you to have anything on that level to be part of this discussion, okay? We're a fangirl. In any case, uh, the other assumption we kind of make is that most songs are on a scale of one to ten. They're not ones, and they're not tens. Um, we've kind of, one of the reasons I started this series with the tone I did is just that I've really felt, and I'm sure you've probably noticed, that extreme view viewpoints in all sorts of fields are a little overrepresented in today's society. Um, and uh, we, I'm not going to say those are wrong or worthless, but I think they have a tendency to block out more, uh, I guess you could say, deep or nuanced opinions. And uh, I think we have a few other things here. Uh, original doesn't necessarily make it better. You want to sort of talk about that, Anne? Yeah, so a lot of people, it's hard to have a, an objective discussion about Pokemon music because there is somewhat of a divide in the fandom where it's like, it came from Japan, therefore it's perfect, and the dub is evil. And the fact is, it's music. It's what we respond to, what we relate to. And y you can have an experience and a really good relationship with anything if it's something that touches you. And it's important to hear those opinions as well. We've also had a few movies where we've gone through the Japanese and English one, and we think they're just both OK. <laughs> yeah, sometimes neither of them is especially beautiful. <laughs> But we love them anyway. Yeah, I don't think we've come up with one that we really dislike or anything like that. So, But uh, that's sort of the, the gist of it right there. Um, and on, another thing we noticed, we talked about kind of Don't See You Love Me a little bit. But some of the songs, they're perfectly good songs. But they're not necessarily the best uh, ending theme song to a movie either. So uh, those are some of our assumptions there. That kind of sets the ground rules. But uh, in any case... Let's talk about what we learned during this. Yeah, so here's kind of a brief overview. Um, I'm not sure how many of the Pokemon movies each of you have seen. Um, there are 21 of them. The 21st one comes out in U.S. theaters. There's a limited digital engagement next month going into early December. There's like four dates there. There are a couple here in the Salt Lake City area if you're local or... A I think I found one in just about every state in the, in the country, so that's, that's pretty nice. Um, but uh, in Japan, uh, why don't you talk about what we sort of noticed broadly about Japan? Yeah, so some of the trends that we noticed was um, in Japanese music um, for the ending themes, it was almost all produced out of house. So the company itself didn't write a song specifically for the movie. They hired an outside artist to write a song that was then tied to the movie. So it kind of came 
we, we kind of got a rising roller coaster of whether or not it really fit the movie and whether or not it you know, was meant to more be a pop single. So that was interesting. We also noticed that it was kind of an even split between male artists and female artists and bands, um, which I think will be a contrast to what we noticed in English. Yeah, and in Japanese, it seems like they, they tie more to the themes of the movie rather than plot or characters specifically. Right, it hits the emotion, but maybe not, you know, specific story arcs. Yeah, I think you've also mentioned that starting with, like, movie seven, they, they, the, the movies are actually written that way as well to be more about a theme than... Yeah, the, yeah the, each movie revolves around a specific theme rather than a specific story. Yeah, now to contrast the English side, let's see, they're usually done by someone with close ties to the English dub, so for like the first five generations, um, a lot of those were written by some folks at 4Kids or John Leffler or stuff like that. The real main exception is actually the first movie, A Weird Miracle, contrary to what you might think, not actually written for Pokemon the first movie. There's an alternate version and that's where the confusion lies sometimes, but it's actually not written for the movie. Um, and they seem to sort of pick out either plot points, characters, stuff like that. Um, and I think uh, going there, I think there's a definite female bend to the uh, artists they have there. There's some ensemble ones, and there's only like two or three, I think, that are performed uh, by a primary male uh, vocalist. And one other thing we wanted to mention, like I said, in this series, we like to bring in outside stuff. For example, uh, I should say non-English, non-Japanese stuff. For example, um, the German version of the second Pokemon movie, uh, The Power of One is on the soundtrack, but it sounds like they actually use a song called Du bist nicht allein, or You Are Not Alone, as the uh, ending theme there. And uh, we talked about that in our European episode that is on my YouTube channel just that recently. That was a surprising song. That it, was not what I expected it to be. Yeah, yeah, we had some interesting things to kind of say about that. And then for the 20th movie, uh, I Choose You, in Singapore they had uh, a song called Future. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I thought it was it was pretty decent. Um, <laughs> like I said, so let's see observations. Let's talk about some of that. So we we talked kind of about our trends. Uh, one thing you'll notice in J-pop music and the Japanese ending themes to Pokemon movies is no exception is that they tend to use a, a decent amount of English lyrics to sort of splice in there or plopped in there. And uh, to be honest. Uh, I kind of think that sometimes if you're not like you don't know much Japanese that that can kind of sort of make the, the the song sound a little bit I don't know frivolous sometimes or yeah, we've we've come to differing opinions on this because I'm kind of a bit more used to English lyrics that don't make sense like how many of you guys listen to J-pop yeah I thought you guys might be <laughs> but yeah how do you guys feel when you listen to music and it's got English lyrics that may or may not seem to make sense in the song like does it decrease your enjoyment or not matter? Because we've come... I think it doesn't matter most of the time. Okay. Like, as long as it's like a fun song anyways. Yeah. And like, say you don't actually know the language, like, <laughs> it's three words you do know if you're going to say properly. Okay. Yeah, we have some uh, interesting observations about specific songs we'll bring up in a little bit. But yeah, yeah, it was an interesting thing we noticed that, yeah, how people relate to language can sometimes change your entire opinion of a song. Yeah. So, um... The, since Japan has had, I guess, more of a music budget than the, the dub has had, they've been able to bring in a lot of rising stars, which seems to be what, the, what they look for. Andy, you want to elaborate on that? Yeah, so they tend to go with names that are really big at the time. So, like, the first music was, like, the biggest name in Enka, Kobayashi Sachiko. Like, as Crystal K came to, into her peak, she got, suddenly got a Pokemon movie. Amaro Namie got a Pokemon movie. Like, all of it happened kind of as they were in their peak. And they tend, yeah, to get somebody who's a big name and very topical for the moment. Whereas I, most of us have not heard of the English artists unless we're really, you know, keyed into that. Yeah, I've been, I've been lucky and gotten a chance to interview a number of them uh, in various capacities over the years. Uh, but, um, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a because the, the budget hasn't quite been there. Um, one other thing about Japan, I, I, although I don't speak much Japanese, I do import a lot of the CDs uh, from Japan. And I noticed that a lot of times they'll actually have, for the movie, like end themes especially, they'll have like two versions of the single. Mm. 
where they have different art on the front. Uh, yeah. Like one is the official like Pokemon version. And one is the charting single, yeah. And it, it's kind of interesting. I don't know how it's changed since, but when I was living over there, yeah, CD buying was still a very big thing. And people went out to buy the physical single, and it was very important thing to have even though you could still buy it online and, and you know as an mp3 so it doesn't surprise me at all that pokemon would like manufacture as many different versions as they could and you know, oh, yeah, yeah. try all to maximize that seller audience yeah yeah so some have more than two but yeah so that's kind of how that works and they'll even have different tracks and actually one thing that's popular in japan is they have a lot of pack-ins sometimes like, uh, like I've had ones that have Pokemon cards in there uh, for, for like the Pokemon version. Some of them pack in like a DVD with like the music video. Keychains or something. Yeah, all kinds of, mm -hmm. of, of value added stuff there. So it's actually, and I think it's still the case that things are, there's still a lot of CD sales there. So very different from the music economy we have here in the States, obviously. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually one thing we keep bringing up, I don't think we've done it too recently, but um, I think it was towards the towards the middle movies like seven, eight, uh, six, seven, eight stuff like that. We've had uh, had to lament that. Uh, speaking of the North American music industry, that uh, iTunes has had a nasty habit through various things of delisting some of the stuff that you used to be able to buy. Yeah. <laughs> um, like in 2009, there was this big purge where they took out all the DRM only tracks. So you lost uh, the second movie score, the extra mile from the second movie, this side of paradise from movie seven, and a bunch of other things. And, and actually, more recently, the uh, for some reason iTunes doesn't have even have to be a master right now these days. It's been since like like May this year. It just vanished from iTunes and Apple Music. Like other services have the album for some reason. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure exactly what happened with that. The world of music distribution is a wide and strange place. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's messy as you've probably guessed. Keep watching for more from this interview.